Good morning, ECC. All right, let's try that again. Good morning, ECC. That's a lot better. It's great to see your faces again. I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. And uh, for those of you who haven't met me, my name is Michael. I'm an assistant pastor at ECC. And um, I want to welcome all of you. Uh, as we worship together, as we sing together, as we hear God's Word preached. And I want us to stand up, please, as I read, I'll, uh, read a passage from Scripture this morning, as we consider God's faithfulness towards us. We are reading from Psalm 103, verse 8 to 12. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our inequities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Beloved, let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your faithful and steadfastness, steadfast love towards us. We pray that as we worship you in truth and in spirit this morning, that you would be pleased to dwell with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Today we'll be singing about God's mercy and grace. Things we ought to be grateful for. Adam. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not as some Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more Praise the Lord, His mercy is more
Good morning, ECC. Please turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 to 10. My name is Ifiok Ikiagu. I am from Nigeria, and it's my pleasure to read God's word to you this morning. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt 
for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a, por a portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she, as she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in the fear, in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour, your judgment has come. Beloved, as we consider these weighty matters of our sin and God's grace towards us, let us go before Him in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. Your, you are slow to anger. Your, your patience astounds us as we consider your steadfast love. Father, we pray that we may fear you and that we will not fear men as we are prone to do. Father, remove our transgressions and our inequities as far as the east is from the west. It's only you that can do this. We are unable and we are in dire need of you, even as we oftentimes long for the things of Babylon, things of this world. Remove worldliness from us. Father, we, we, when we consider our state before you, we are humbled at what you've done for us, and we are grateful for who you are and what you've done. In light of this, Father, we bring petitions before you, knowing that ECC is now entering into a new season, and we thank you for your faithfulness, and that as your son has said that you will, he will build the church, and we see this evident in the life of ECC. Father, we pray for continued faithfulness. We pray for boldness in evangelism. May we continue to flee from Babylon and remove the stain that we cannot hide. Father, we pray for David and Anna Winning, uh, who have been in this covenant community for quite a long time. We, we thank you for their faithfulness and your faithfulness towards them. Father, we pray specifically for Anna as she, uh, for her health, for her for speedy recovery. Father, if it is your will that she may continue to abide with us, but that you would abide with her even in this challenging season of her life. Father, we pray for the church in Fujera with, this, with the planning of a new building. We pray for J.C. Brannan, the new pastor there, and the, the strategic location of, of that church, that you would continue to use that church to bring many sons and daughters to glory. Father, we pray for uh, and just say thank you for the sermon series that we've been able to sit through and listen through, through the teaching of our pastors as we consider your word to us from the prophet Zechariah. Speak to us in your word. Open our hearts. 
We pray for those who are unbelieving among us, that they would repent and put their faith in Christ. Father, now as we turn to the preaching of your word, we pray for Pastor Aubrey, that he would preach and show us Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Good morning. It's great to be with you all. If you would please turn your Bible to the book of Zechariah, chapter 5, as we continue this sermon series. If you're wondering, oh, uh, last week was Zechariah 3, and and why have we jumped over chapter 4? What's going on with that? Are we skipping portions of the Word of God? The the answer is no. We are not uh, skipping chapter 4. We've actually, I actually preached chapter 4 earlier this year, uh, a couple of months back, so in January, as part of my candidating series here, I preached uh, Zechariah 4. So, uh, you know, I would uh, encourage you to go back and listen to that. It's available online, and, and that way you can see the flow from chapter 3 to chapter 4 uh, to chapter 5. It's a, chapter 4 is a very central and important chapter, actually, in this book. Zechariah chapter 5. Some things cannot dwell together in the same house. Some things are so incompatible that they cannot occupy the same space. Now, I remember an unforgettable experience. Uh, Sometimes we have experiences in our family that you never forget, and this is one of those. Uh, This was many years ago uh, when uh, we didn't have children yet. Nishika and I were married. She was pregnant with uh, Eliana, our first And we were in our uh, apartment in Louisville. We were both sitting uh, on the couch, uh, tired. I was a busy seminary student back in those days. I think we were talking or praying something, and and Nishika all of a sudden said, what's that? And I looked up, and I was like, what is that? And there was something moving around in the air. For a moment, I thought it was a moth, but that's too big to be a moth. And the next words out of my wife's mouth were, It's a bat! And uh, I didn't know what to do. I said, let's go! So we just ran out of the living room, out of the front door, and closed the door, and we're outside our apartment uh, at around 8 or 9 in the night, uh, and we were just standing outside looking at each other, and the bat was occupying the inside of our home. And we just uh, stood there wondering, you know, what are we going to do with this bat? Uh, We must have stood around for about, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes before we finally decided, okay, you know, there's a uh, brother from Scotland staying nearby, and, uh, you know, he he seems like quite the brave fellow, and uh, I went over to his house and uh, rang the doorbell, and he came in uh, to the apartment boldly, and I was creeping behind him, and the bat had settled on our, uh, I think on our dryer, Uh, clothes dryer, and then he took a towel and threw it over the bat, scooped up the bat in the towel, and went outside and sent it away. And we could live in our apartment again and go to sleep that night. Some things are incompatible and cannot occupy the same space. It was either us or the bat. Either the bat or us, not both. You know, sometimes God's dwelling place can have some unwelcome guests. Unwelcome guests who have made a home in God's house and among God's people. Things with which the Holy Lord cannot bear to dwell. As one theologian said, there are some things incompatible with God and offensive to His holiness. Brothers and sisters, our God is holy. He is the Holy One of Israel. He is the Holy Lord. The angels cry out, holy, holy, holy. And He cannot bear to dwell with sin. 
So in Zechariah 5, what we're going to see this morning are two visions, and these are closely related visions from Zechariah that show us the Lord's clean-up plan, how He's going to clean up and clear out from among His people and from His dwelling place. These are visions 6 and 7 in the total of eight visions that we see in the beginning of this book of Zechariah. And so, brothers and sisters, as we consider these truths, as we think about the fact that we, the church, are the dwelling place of God, the Holy Lord dwells among us, may these visions sober us and may they awaken us to properly deal with any unrepentant sin in our lives and in our community. So two visions. Each vision has a message. They're both closely related. And we'll begin with vision one. And the message of vision one is, beware, the Lord will judge sin among his people. Beware, because the Lord will judge sin among his people. Let's pick it up in verse one. Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and its width 10 cubits. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. For everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side, and everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name, and it shall remain in his house and consume it, both timber and stones. So if you've been following along in our series through the book of Zechariah with its glorious promises, you will recall that the theme of this book, the message of Zechariah, is that the Lord has brought his people back from Babylon, and he wants to dwell with them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. The Lord is returning to be king over his people, to dwell in the midst of his people. And we, and we see that theme developed in this promise in Zechariah 2, if you remember, of the promise of a glorious heavenly city overflowing with the people of God, with God in her midst as our glory. If you remember my sermon from Zechariah 4, you would recall that Zechariah is seeing the vision of the completed work, the lampstand which used to stand in the heart of the temple. Of course, when the temple is rebuilt, God dwells in her midst. And so they're hopeful for the rebuilding of the temple and the return of the Lord, Yahweh, to be among them. But you see, there's a problem. These people have come back from Babylon where they were exiled. And when they came back, they have brought with them some unwelcome guests, some sins and some practices, unrepentant sin that continues to cling to them. They have in their midst sin that has not been properly dealt with. And if the Lord is going to dwell with his people, then he is going to deal with this. The issue here is a little bit different from what we saw last week in Zechariah chapter 3. Over there, the issue was uncleanness and guilt. And the Lord acts in sovereign grace to take off our filthy clothes and give us a right standing before Him. Well, in today's text, the issue is unrepentance. Unrepentance. People continuing to live in deliberate sin in the community, among the people of God. The burning question is, God has brought the people out of Babylon, but how is he going to take Babylon out of the people? Like my professor used to say. How will the Lord take Babylon out of his people, out of their hearts? And here the first vision answers that question by saying, the Lord will judge sin among his people. And of course, if you're looking at the vision there, Zechariah says in verse 2, I see a flying scroll, its length is 20 cubits and its width 
10 qubits. So there's this scroll. It's very large. I'll describe its dimensions to you in a little bit. And it was flying. And the angel tells Zechariah what it is. The angel says, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. Even just seeing a scroll with writing on it would have reminded Zechariah the prophet of God's law. It would remind Zechariah the prophet of God's word. We do not stand over God's word. God's word stands over us. And here particularly, the word of God is coming containing a curse. This is the curse that goes out over all the land. And, and immediately Zechariah would recognize what this means because Zechariah knows the Bible. He's been reading the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, in the law, the Lord commits a curse. He promises a curse upon all those who live in disobedience to his word. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 to 28 God says when he's giving them the law, see I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you today and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. There's a curse for breaking God's law. These people had already, their, their forefathers had already experienced it because they tasted God's curse and were exiled, carried off to Babylon. But now they've come back to the land and for those who continue in unrepentant sin, those who cling on to sin and wickedness in the community, there is a curse of God that is coming. Notice verse 3. Where is this curse going out? The curse is going out over the face of the whole land. And, and that doesn't mean the face of the whole earth in this context. When he says the curse is going over the face of the whole land, it's going through the land of Israel. It's going among the people of God. Those who think that they are safe because they've come back to the land because they're building the temple, it's going out among them over the community of God's people. And it says there, for everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side. Everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. If you're reading the language there in the original or if you have the CSB, Christian Standard Bible Translation, it's very helpful. You would understand that what is happening here is this, these thieves in the land and, and these people who had sworn falsely, they had been treated as innocent. Nobody dealt with their sin. They had been acquitted from their crimes and allowed to live peacefully without anyone addressing what they had done. The people had not dealt with this unrepentant sin in their midst. Direct violations of God's law. Swearing falsely in God's name. Stealing others' property. And no one had dealt with it. Well, the Lord is going to deal with it. And the Lord is going to show His people that unrepentant sinners cannot dwell in a community that is ruled by God Almighty, the King. The Lord himself is going to clean them out. And I want you to think, as you think about the fact that this scroll represents a curse, think about how this scroll is described. First of all, its size, verse 2, its length is 20 cubits and its width 10 cubits. A cubit was one and a half feet. So this is 30 feet by 15 feet. This is a very, very large Scroll. It's as big as this entire stage. I, I, before the service, I asked Cass, what, is the di what are the dimensions of the stage? And he said, oh, about 30 feet by 15 feet. That's the size of the scroll. From this end to this end and from top to bottom. This is a massive, massive billboard-sized scroll. You cannot miss it. You cannot escape it. It is ominous. 
It is confronting, it is uncompromising, and it, when it enters the house, it will fill the whole place. Unrepentant sinners, those who are living in secret sin, beware. The Lord has a record, and His curse is going out. Second, notice that the scroll is flying. The scroll is flying, which indicates that it's moving fast. Judgment is imminent. Judgment is coming soon. There's an urgency here. This is so large that you cannot escape it, and it's moving fast towards you. When you see a very large object moving at a very high speed, that's a frightening thing. Friends, the Lord is patient and kind. He is gracious with steadfast love and slow to anger. And He waits and He waits. He has waited for a long time to send this scroll. That's another reason for its big size. The sins of the people are accumulating and accumulating and filling up this entire space. But when the Lord brings His judgment, when He decides it's time, it comes flying. Notice also, this scroll, you cannot hide from it. Verse 4, I will send it out, declares the Lord. It shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name. Like the old saying goes, you can run, but you can't hide. There is no hiding place. There is no safety, not even in the privacy and seclusion of your own home. And what does the scroll do when it enters the whole house? It shall remain in his house and consume it, both timber and stones. That's deadly. There is no escape from the judgment of God. And the fact that it says it consumes both timber and stones so shows that this is a complete and utter destruction that the judgment and the curse of God brings upon those who dare to live in rebellion against Him. The persons upon whom this curse comes, there will be utter ruin and nothing left. As one person said, by these words, Zechariah reminds us how terrible it is to fall into the hands of God, for he will punish the ungodly and the wicked, and he reduces them to nothing. So brothers and sisters, just a note of warning there for us, isn't it? That we ought to live above board, that we ought to live with integrity and truth and honesty in all our dealings. It's a, it's a call to us, a reminder from the Lord, not to hide our sin, not to hide in our sin, to take holiness seriously. There's a question for us this morning. What are the sins that you've brought out of Babylon with you into the Christian life? And have you dealt with those? What's your plan to deal with those? I also want to emphasize the fact that this is speaking to a community. Why are these two particular sins are being addressed, swearing falsely uh, in God's name and, and stealing? I think it's because this were, this we, these were the particular sins of this community at that time. You'll see later in Zechariah 8, the Lord admonishes them not to do these two things, to be truthful with one another, to, to live with integrity. The people had these particular sins in their midst. I wonder what the particular and common sins are in our church community. The Lord knows. I might not know or have a complete, I have some ideas, but I think the Lord knows. I think one sin, community sin, that tends to creep into ECC at times is uh, the sin of bitterness, where people uh, can live in an unreconciled 
sort of way, holding grudge against someone else in the church for a long time, or getting upset about something and you never go and talk to anyone about it, and then all of a sudden it blows up, or you, know, you suddenly send an email saying, you know, I'm angry about all these things and I'm leaving, bye-bye. The Lord knows the particular sins of His people. Just like He knew what this community of people were struggling with, He knows what we struggle with. And most importantly, this passage speaks to us about church discipline, doesn't it? The practice of church discipline, where as a church, as, as, a, as the body of Christ, we are concerned to address sin and root it out from our midst. That we don't leave sin unaddressed. We don't just try and sweep it under the rug. We don't leave people in their sin without confrontation, without going and, and addressing it with them. I know maybe for some of our cultures it's difficult, but it's difficult in every culture, brothers and sisters. In the East, ch church discipline is difficult because you don't want to uh, confront someone and, and it feels like, oh, you're bringing shame. In the West, church discipline is difficult because everybody says, oh, just mind your own business. This is, you know, don't invade someone's private personal space. It's difficult in every culture. But we are responsible for guarding the purity of God's dwelling place, the purity of God's church. And if we don't warn people and admonish them and even remove them from the church because of their sin, then they will face a far greater judgment. God will judge them. The Lord is holy. And if we don't give people warnings and judge sin in our midst, the Lord will come and judge them. The church, brothers and sisters, must be a holy people. We must be a pure people. We must be a spotless and pure dwelling place for the holy Lord God Almighty. And, and this should fill our prayers, that we pray for the holiness of the people of God. When was the last time you prayed for the holiness of the church? You know, make it your habit. I, I pray through the members' directory. Try to pray through that regularly. Our, uh, you know, our team of uh, staff, we get together, the pastors and the apprentices, and we pray through the members' directory, page by page. And even if there's someone there you see you don't know, one thing good you can pray for them is pray for their holiness. Pray that they walk holy and blameless and above reproach before the Lord. Jesus cares about holiness in His church. You know, I remember one pastor was speaking to us, to a group of pastors at the Council of Evangelical Churches, and he was speaking on the practice of church discipline, and he said, when Jesus addresses the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, he repeatedly warns them that if they do not deal with their sins, he will make war against them and even remove the lampstand. That's amazing, that's shocking. There was only like one church in each of those towns, do you know? So Jesus would rather have no church, no witness to his name in a city than have a church that is not practicing church discipline. And the result is his name being mingled with sin. He would rather have no witness than have his name associated with sin. And so as one scholar says, this is one of the most terrifying warning passages in the Old Testament. There is no room for complacency. God's law cannot be disregarded without punishment. Repentance is an urgent matter. And so, brothers and sisters, beware. God himself sends out the curse. I will send it out, says the Lord. There is no escape. And for those who face it, there will be total and eternal destruction. So let us beware. And let us take this seriously in our lives and in our community. So that's the first vision. God is going to judge sin among his people. The second vision shows us another way that God deals with sin among his people. And the message of the second vision is very similar to the first. Remember, this is Dolby surround sound. Right Now we're in stereo. First speaker turned on, gave us a message. The second speaker turns on and gives us a very similar message coming from a different perspective. The message of the second vision is prepare because the Lord will banish sin from His place. We must beware because the Lord will judge sin among His people and we must prepare because the Lord will banish sin from His place. Look at verses 5 to 11. 
The angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, lift your eyes and see what is this that is going out. And I said, what is it? He said, this is the basket that is going out. And he said, this is their iniquity in all the land. And behold, the leaden cover was lifted and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the leaden weight on its opening. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. Then I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they taking the basket? He said to me, to the land of Shinar, to build a house for it. And when this is prepared, they will set the basket down there on its base. So this is kind of strange. Zechariah is now looking. He's just seen this big flying scroll. And the next thing he sees suddenly is a basket going out. Zechariah says, what is this basket? And, and the angel says, oh, this is, this, is the ba- this is the basket that is going out. This is the iniquity in all the land, the sin in all the land. And then all of a sudden, there's a big lead cover on this basket. So it's a very heavy cover. Lead is heavy, right? It's a heavy metal. <laughs> they, they, they open up the cover and out pops this woman. Like, oh, there's a woman in the basket. And, you know, you might imagine one, her one way or the other. Maybe, you know, she's a shady lady, very pretty and seductive. Maybe she's an, you know, ugly old witch who's, you know, looking... Like she's ready to eat somebody, I don't know. Whatever the case, this woman is not just a woman, this is not saying something bad about women in general. In fact, uh, you know, I try to avoid this, but there, there's, a, there's a little uh, pun in the Hebrew there. The woman is, uh, in Hebrew, is the word Isha, and her name, verse 8, is wickedness, which in Hebrew is Risha. So an Isha named Risha. This is wickedness. That's, that's what this woman represents, sin, wickedness. This is Lady Babylon herself. And, and then Zechariah sees two other women come, and they have the wings of a stork, which if you've seen a stork, they have really large wings with great power to fly long distances. And the stork in ancient Israel was known to have a particular migration pattern. They fly north and then east. North and east, that's the route you take to go to a certain place. What is that place? Well, where are they taking the basket? Verse 11, to the land of Shinar. Which if you know, Shinar is another name for Babylon. That was Babylon's original name. That's where they built the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. Shinar is Babylon. This Basket, this iniquity and sin is headed northward and eastward, back to Babylon, return to sender. And there's something else very significant here that I want you to see. Where else in the Bible do you see some kind of a container with something very important in it, with a lid, and with two figures with wings on either side? Well, it's the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, the, the box that used to be inside the Holy of Holies in the dwelling place of God in the temple. And, and, and this basket is now being lifted and taken away to Babylon. And what's going to happen there? He says, well, they're going to build a house for it. What is a house? The word house there means a dwelling. And in the Bible, when the, when the Bible speaks of God's temple, it's always called a house. It's the dwelling place of God. So here in Israel, Zechariah and the people are building God's temple, building God's house, his dwelling place. But there's this unwelcome guest, this woman named Wickedness, and she needs to be taken away. Sin needs to be taken away to its own dwelling place, its own temple, out in the land of Babylon. Again, this scene also resembles what we've seen in the book of Ezekiel. You see, when the people were judged by God and taken into exile, there's a scene in the first 11 chapters of Ezekiel where God himself is leaving the temple because of his people's sin. His glory is departing. 
Think of Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 18. The glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house, that's the temple, and stood over the cherubim. These are the winged creatures. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth before my eyes as they went out with wheels beside them. God had departed the temple because of his people's sin. And here Zechariah 5 is showing us the opposite. God is saying, I'm coming back to the temple, which means your sin needs to get out. And the fact that this wickedness, this sin is taken off to Babylon and put in its own house, in its own dwelling place, in its own temple, shows that sin has become some kind of a mini-God. And so what we're seeing here is, is the opposite of God coming to dwell with his people. This is the anti-God, the anti-ark, the basket, going off to the anti-temple in the place that is opposed to everything holy to the Lord, Babylon, where it is a false god that it is worshipped. You know that all sin basically amounts to this, all sin is idolatry. Idols are not just made of wood and stone, you know. They're any kind of sin that comes to enslave you and begins to dominate your life. That's an idol and a false god. The early church uh, theologian Tertullian used to say, all sins are found in idolatry, and idolatry is found in all sins. In the Reformation, it was said, the human heart is an idol factory, constantly churning out idols. Our hearts find things and invent ways to drift away from God, to drift away from His rule over our lives. And the Lord is saying to you this morning, the Lord is saying to us, your idol, your pet sin, your iniquity, it cannot dwell in the same house as me. The true God and false gods cannot occupy the same space. Your sin must be banished and sent away. I don't even want to see it. The woman is popping her head out. Push her back in and close the basket. You know, kids in, in this world, you're going to hear a lot of messages from a lot of people. And this world is going to tell you to embrace your sin and put it on display and flaunt it for everyone to see. You know, we don't have, a, you may, may not think, a lady, lady named Risha, but there's a lady named Lady Gaga who's going to tell you, you're born this way. Just be yourself and you're set. Well, God wants to put Lady Gaga in a box so that nobody sees it and sends it away. Brothers and sisters, what are the idols that are occupying the space in your heart, in your lives, that only the Lord deserves? If someone was to look at your smartphone, at your browsing history, at your WhatsApp conversations, what would that reveal about who takes first place in your life? If someone was to look into your deepest thoughts, your feelings, your desires. Is the Lord in the picture? Is His glory your primary pursuit? Or, or is it something else? You know, we can take good things and turn them into sin by becoming enslaved to them. Financial security, earning more money, gaining more friends and popularity. Some of us are tempted We've been rescued from Babylon, and some of us are tempted to get a return ticket for this lady named Wickedness and bring her back into our lives and back into the church. Others of you might be tempted, maybe you've already done this, to jump into the basket with her and fly off out into the world. In COVID-19 pandemic season, that's very easy. You just don't show up, don't tune in, don't stay connected. Just get in the basket and close the lid. And friends, don't think that you're safe just because you call yourself a Christian or because you're part of the church. Think about these people were back in God's land. They were building God's temple, but they hadn't removed their sin. Being a part of God's people, being in God's place, offers no protection for unrepentant sinners. 
And so we are reminded of the message of the book of Zechariah, return to me, says the Lord, and I will return to you. If we are to be God's dwelling place, his holy temple, then he wants us to be pure and present ourselves to him blameless. So that's the warning of this vision. Prepare, because the Lord is about to banish sin from his place. Friends, if you've been listening week after week, You've seen the Lord is going to one day renew his creation and establish his heavenly city in glory forever. And all sin and all sinners will be banished forever from that place because it is the Lord's place. Those who make their union with this woman named wickedness will go with her where she goes to Shinar, to Babylon. And together with this woman named Wickedness, they will face the doom of Babylon, which we heard read earlier today from Revelation 18. That city is going to burn up in flames and it will burn forever and ever. So which way are we going to go? And yet, you know, even as we are sobered by our sin, as we are sobered by the curse that goes out over all the land, as we think about our own sin and the wickedness in our own hearts, yet in the middle of all that, there's good news. Because the Lord has acted to redeem us from our curse, and He has begun the work of taking away our sin. We saw in the first vision the, the scroll with the curse that goes out across all the land against unrepentant evildoers. Well, brothers and sisters, there's also a gospel that should go out across the land. You and me have the privilege and the responsibility to take that gospel out across the land. And that gospel gives us a promise and a way to be free from the curse that comes upon us because of sin. Galatians chapter 3 verses 14, uh, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. The scroll with the curse that goes into the house and destroys it completely. That curse came upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Who went to the cross as a substitute for sinners. The curse of the scroll destroyed him on the cross so that you and I could be free from the penalty of sin. Jesus took the scroll and nailed it to his own cross. Colossians 2.14 He has canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. All of the charges on that big bad scroll Nailed to the cross once for all as the Son of God paid the penalty for our sin. All of us deserve this curse. All of us deserve God's judgment. And we deserve eternal ruin. But Christ has taken upon himself the curse for sinners. The scroll with all these charges. And he has nailed it to the cross so that we might be forgiven. So either we repent of sin and flee to the one who has borne our curse. Or we stand face to face to face the curse ourselves. In, in the second vision, we saw God banishing wickedness and sin from his place. And as you read that, you know that the, the, the truth. The truth is that you and I, all of us, we deserve to be put in this basket and sent away to Babylon to burn and to be destroyed in our sin. And yet God gives us hope to be purified from sin and to enter his heavenly city. Because instead of us being banished, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he was banished. He was forsaken. He was exiled. The one who had his home in heaven from all eternity was forsaken on the cross as he hung there dying under the wrath and judgment of God, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he did this so that our sins could be removed from us as far as the east is from the west, as far as Babylon is from Jerusalem. 
And he's begun the process of purifying our hearts and our lives even now. We are free from sin's penalty. We have been freed from sin's power. We're growing in more and more sin being taken away. And one day, we'll be completely free from sin's presence when Jesus comes back to dwell with us again with his people and he will cast out wickedness and sin forever. So we can get ready for that day as a spotless bride, as a spotless and clean dwelling place. Or we can join this woman wickedness in the city that's going to burn. That's what faces us. That's the choice. I want to speak to non-Christian friends who are here this morning. Or if you're a believer in Christ, a professed faith in Christ, and you're living in unrepentant sin secretly, I want to speak to us all. You can be free from sin's penalty and the curse of judgment that hangs over you today. You can face the sentence of condemnation and, and God's curse, or you can be free of it by repenting and trusting in Jesus who took the curse on himself. That curse has been born and you will be free from sin's penalty. So come and put your trust in Christ. You can be free of sin's power and its hold over your life today. You know, I know how it is to live in that bondage. I've been there. You feel trapped by your sin. You, you, can't es- you feel like you can't escape. You just wonder who will save me. What a wretched person I am. But when you come to Christ the one who suffered for sinners, he will shut up your sin, put it in a basket, and send it away so that you never see it again. So come to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, let's pursue holiness in the fear of the Lord. Let's not hide any unrepentant sin in our hearts or lives. If there's anyone here living in secret sin, it's time to confess and repent. And let's pursue holiness so that we are a spotless and pure bride for our Lord Jesus who's going to dwell with us forever. I'm part of a network of pastors that once a month we have Zoom calls where we just pray for one another and try to encourage one another. And last week, one of the brothers was sharing that his church building they found was built using a very harmful and poisonous substance called asbestos which, you know, it releases particles which go into your lungs and cause lung disease and cancer. And he said the asbestos was so much that we have to tear down the whole church building and build a new one. And he asked for prayer. You know, sometimes sin can become like asbestos in the church. Let's make sure that our church doesn't need to be torn down, but that we'll be a good dwelling place. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus and what he's done. Help us to live in holiness and righteousness as a pure dwelling place for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thus, we sing of God's grace, grace greater than our sin. Oh
Right, uh, just a few things uh, today before we're dismissed. Uh, one is that if you're new here and if you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. Uh, we'd love to get to know you more, love to share with you ways to get connected to uh, groups in our church and uh, to become a part of the church family. All you need to do is uh, give us uh, your information here, uh, just connect with us, maybe scan that QR code or send us an email or WhatsApp and uh, we'll get back to you and would love to uh, show you how to be involved at ECC. Uh, the, the second announcement is uh, next week, like I've shared before, is a special service. I was appointed uh, senior pastor here at ECC in uh, January, and uh, next week we'll be having a formal service of installation uh, with some special guests uh, who will be here in the morning, as well as a uh, special Zoom call in the evening uh, where Pastor Cam has already confirmed that he will be joining one of the former senior, beloved senior pastors of this church and uh, Pastor Jeremy is hoping to be there as well, plus other guests. So uh, please do mark that on your calendars uh, as, as your pastor. It would be my great joy uh, to see all of our members there. So um, just mark that. And then I also want to bring you information about Easter. So Good Friday, we'll have our regular Friday morning services here. Uh, because of the current uh, coronavirus regulations, we cannot have an Easter service this year in person. But we will have a Zoom call on the evening of Easter Sunday, and we will connect on that day and, and remember and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we really should celebrate, and we celebrate every uh, week and every day all year round, but this is a special time to connect and do that. Uh, with that, we will close our service. If you'll all please stand. 
And may the Lord bless you with this good word from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, we're going to dismiss uh, section by section, and today I'm going to begin with this section right here. 